Okay, hello, good morning. Welcome to Fox Around the World panel. My name is Hong Phu Deng, one of the organizers of Fox Asia. The main objectives of Fox Asia, somebody to bring people together from different communities, different projects across borders to share, exchange, and collaborate. We are here because we believe in the value of force and its impact on our life and society. In the panel today, we have four speakers coming from very different backgrounds. We have two people represent the corporate side and two people here represent the community side. And today we will find out how company and community can work together to scale and sustain open source projects around the world. With that, I would like to start to briefly introduce our panelists. I would like to start with um, June O'Brien, who is the head of open source at Indeed.com. He is passionate about enabling smart and mean meaningful contribution to open source ecosystem by both developers and corporations. John himself is a developer an agile coach, a game tester, a build engineer, an automatic testing specialist, and he has been raising money for charity on and off for over 15 years, both as individual and as part of his job. Actually, I heard about you from a lot of uh, common connection between us. I believe that we attended many conferences together in the past, but never get a chance to, to meet in person. Yeah, I, I have the same sense I, I, that we have been in a lot of the same events, but just have not managed to actually connect with each other. So it was really nice to connect with you and be here at Fonce Asia. Yes, thank you very much for, for joining us to Fonce Asia Summit for the first time. And I remember that also your first time to Singapore. Yeah, it's my first time to Singapore as well. So welcome to, to Singapore and to Fonce Asia Summit. Um, my first impression about you, well, I would like to continue the conversation, but I feel you are a very approachable and warm person. So I, can, I feel that even though you work for a big company, anyone from the audience or, uh, can just approach you easily and ask questions. And you're really patient, like try to sit down and explain to people uh, how everything works. So I really appreciate that. And thank you very much for sharing and being here. Uh, thank you. I think it's important to share the information that we have from the company perspective and from our own, so thank you. Thank you. Du Duane, I'm gonna need a hug later. <laughs> they, they haven't even gotten to you yet, it's, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, so next I have um, Gregory Demere, who is a system network administrator by day and a conference organizer by night, just like myself. He is one of the main organizers of FOSDEM, the largest free and open source conference in Europe. He has been involved in the organization of the events in 2005. He currently serves as the director of the not-for-profit behind the conference and wears many other hats within FOSDEM team. So Rary is not only our speaker, he also a volunteer here at Force Asia Summit who has been very busy recording all the sessions here in this room the last few days for us. So thank you very much, Rary. It was an absolute pleasure to do so. And welcome to Singapore and also thank to you. Force Asia Summit for the first time. Thank you. Indeed, it's my first time. <laughs> very happy to be here. Okay, good. Very good. Next, I have uh, Michael Cheng. So Michael Cheng, also wear many other hats. He is, I must see if I do something wrong with the microphone. He is a trained lawyer, a Raspberry Pi fanatic. He currently supporting open source program office at Facebook. He is also a board member of Open Chain, an initiative by the Linux Foundation to make open source license compliance similar and more consistent. He is also a board member of the Rap QL Foundation. But more interestingly, you have a very international background, Michael. You were born in Taiwan, currently based in the US, spent over 10 years in China, Thailand, Japan, Myanmar, Hong Kong. <laughs> what bring you everywhere? What brought you to so many different places? Um. It's hard to say. Maybe 
10 years from now, I'll, I'll figure that answer out when I'm sitting in a therapist's office. <laughs> um, uh, but I do like to travel, so it is what it is. I actually just spoke at FOSDOM a while back, and uh, it's, it's probably my second time around the circuit, and so uh, Dwayne and I just came from the Open Source Leadership Summit. So I went to FOSDOM, I went to a lot of co other conferences. We went to the Linux Foundation Open Source Summit, and I came here. And um, yeah, we much, we much prefer FOSDOM. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, but as compared to the Open Source Leadership yes. Summit, not Yes, yes, to and, and, <laughs> and, and this, is, um, this is completely off topic, what, we were, what, what, what you were asking me, but um, this feels much more like, like home, you know? The conference is like this, right? Like at FOSM they had, uh, they had the, the bouncers at Delirium Cafe who'd ask you the questions, and that was just <laughs> the coolest thing ever, right? So. Which question did you get? So uh, I, got, uh, I got the first three questions wrong, and then they asked me, um, what's, the most, what's, what's the next stable release of Debian? And I do Raspberry Pi stuff a lot, so I knew that answer is Buster, right? Um, but but the first three questions I got wrong because I'm not technical enough. But at least at least I got in, it, and it felt earned, right? It felt like I I belonged, which was like like a very cool feeling. Right? So um, I think I first got into contact with you about two months before the Voice Asia summit when you said that Facebook is interested to find out more to learn about Voice Asia. And also the first time Facebook became one of our sponsors. And uh, I really like Michael in a way that when he communicates with us, I don't feel that we talk to a sponsor. So I feel that he's like a community member. So I can share with him anything. I can tell him our difficulty and talk openly about expectations. So this is something that I really like. And I did not expect company like Facebook would be so uh, open and collaborative. So thank you very much for, me, for being here. Thank you. Okay, so last but not least, Roland Turner, who I have a personal relationship, who is not only my very good friend, my very good colleague who have been involved, who have been working, we are working together in the Force Asia Summit since 2015. He is, in his daytime, he is the Chief Privacy Officer for Trustphere, where he's responsible for the company's information policy and practices. He is also a founding member of the hackerspace here in Singapore. He advised and support multiple entrepreneurs, in particular the Stack Up Leadership Singapore Chapter, JFDI Accelerator Program, DBS, and NUS Social Venture Challenge Asia. He is an amateur radio operator with a particular interest in space. Do I miss anything, Roland? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I do a range of things. <laughs> okay, so really have a very interesting panelist here for this session. So uh, before I start with my first question, I would like to encourage you to openly share and discuss among each other. So you don't have to wait for the question. So please feel free to speak to each other. I understand for most of you, this is the first time we get to know each other as well. Okay, so. Um, to um, kick things off, I'd love to ask each of the speakers here to tell us what brought you to open source in the first place, what is your current role and responsibility in the first organization or project that you involve with, and finally, please tell us some things that most people don't know about you. Yeah, so how about, um, let's start with uh, Rary. What brought you to force them? What, what are your main responsibility now in the organization? Um, well, I started off in, uh, with the network team in FOSDEM. Um, someone said, hey, come and join this event, help organize it, it will be fun. Um, it won't take too much of your time. Um, that was a lie, <laughs> a blatant lie. Um, I've moved on through the organization, doing many different things, just helping out where hands were needed. Um, and finally, well, the last few years I've been very busy doing video because, well, um, the scale of our event really calls for um, a very specific solution. 
Um, but I've also been doing many other things within the organization. I, I uh, partially do sponsorships. Um, I do general question answering. Um, I'm still part of the program committee for some bits of the, of the program that we run. Um, so that's why I wrote that I wear many hats within the organization. Um, and yeah, as to your question, what brought me into open source is um, I have been using a computer since mm, the mid-90s, I think. Um, and as every child of the mid-90s in a Western country, I was given a Windows computer. Um, and I felt very unsatisfied with what I was able to do. Um, I broke the thing many, many times. Um, and I was trying to understand how the computer actually worked, but I saw that I was more working with a specific operating system rather than um, understanding how the computer was, was actually working. Um, so I was looking for so something new, and then I stumbled up on Linux and installed pretty much all of the distributions um, and found some I liked and kept on using that, and that's how it all started. And it felt very comfortable, and then I learned, and it's only then that I learned about the, the principles behind all of it, the, the idea, the spirit, um, and the community feeling, and I was absolutely charmed by it all. So that's why I stayed. Before we go on to the next thing, I'd really like to call out the, the value that the FOSDEM video team provides for the wider community. Uh, if, if a conference wanted to pay to have all of their talks recorded, it would be prohibitively expensive. And uh, the amount of content that your team makes available to everyone through your efforts is, is really a tremendous gift to the community. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. We think it's really important to, to not only get the content at the event itself and, and um, available to, to a limited number of people, but to allow remote participation. Lots of people can't make it to your conference. So it's actually great that people engage with your attendees through remote participation even. Um, we have hackerspaces all around the world setting up um, streaming events to watch the FOSDEM live stream together. For those who can't make it to the event, I think that's absolutely fantastic to see. So happy to see that it's a reality. Um, sure. Uh, if I, I'll try to rewind all the questions in order as I, as I can think about it. Uh, I was starting my tech career as Linux was kind of exploding. Um, and uh, I was very young in my career, and I did not come from a technical background. I, 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 at best, I, I, I say I came from a liberal arts background. I actually uh, went to a religious college. Um, and so I spent maybe the first two thirds of my career feeling like I was trying to catch up to a technology curve that was just out of my grasp. And, and kind of in the, uh, a, a very typical like pre-open source contributor mindset of I'm not smart enough to do this. I'm not. There's nothing I can add to the community, right? Um, so there were a lot of you know long nights chasing through dependencies, trying to get something to work in the garage, and and a lot of struggling with things. But uh, overall, my like participation in the open source community was was fairly limited. Um, there was a uh, I think pre-Bugzilla, there was a bug tracker called Mantis that, uh, uh, you, you remember Mantis, I think, um, that was my first open source contribution to add a flag to make it work uh, if installed on Windows NT. So that gives everybody kind of a framework for where I was uh, in my career. Um, uh, and I was always working uh, on things that were you know, using a lot of open source technology or adjacent to other groups that were doing open source work. But it wasn't really until I uh, took the role at PayPal running day-to-day -day operations of the open source programs office um, where I was helping developers uh, get their work approved by legal and sort of uh, serving as the, uh, uh, the open source concierge or the open source service man, which is kind of where the jumpsuits came from, uh, trying to solve other people's problems that uh, I, I really started to grow into the role uh, that I have now, which is head of open source at Indeed where I manage everything from sponsorships and involvement to policy and um, designing initiatives to encourage people to get over that hesitation that I myself had in the beginning of making their first few contributions and, and getting a taste for it. 
Uh, yeah. Um, so I guess I got out into open source, um, you know, as a kid in the mid '90s, right? Um, it. it uh, I think. I was I was sort of uh, I mostly weaponized computers against my parents. Um, so it was just like uh, just fun to do that um, in in all sorts of ways. And so I think that got me got me really interested in in um, well as part of as part of that I, I also dropped out of high school and I did a lot of other stuff. But uh, but but one of the things one one of the things the benefits about being alive in the mid '90s is that you know network engineering was very much a very lucrative job back then. So I got into Linux through doing sysadmin um, and a lot of sort of back end uh, infra, infra stack you know um, maintenance. And so so that that's that's where um, probably one of some of my contribution had to do with back end automation, things to automate IT stacks and things like that. Um, I, I think. I've always always been interested in it, and I've always had this view of the community. But I've it wasn't until I sort of had more of a legal role that I sort of came to appreciate the the benefits that it, it would bring, right? And I think I I see it as this kind of very unique um, sort of community that 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 is actually. Um, where the, where, the, where the values actually uh, are more important than the leverage, right? Because a lot of communities are actually based on the leverage of, you know, may not necessarily be the size of the company, but there's other things, right? Maybe maybe the 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 purity of the you know the the you know, the dogma or some other thing, right? But but I think here the the community is mostly based on certain values of openness and inclusiveness, right? And 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 I think, I think, the way that sort of, you know, the legal, the legal, the sort of license, the way you know, the, the role that licenses play within that, I think is really, you know, can be weaponized, that in a way that that can be de you know, harmful to the community or can be beneficial, right? And you know, one of the things that I became more interested in is is, is figuring out a way to. Uh, to use the law, use legal tools to safeguard the community, which is something that I find is very compelling. That's more or less, uh, that, that's more or less. One, two, okay. That's more or less Stallman's sort of innovation with the, the copyleft licenses, which is like, okay, copyright exists. Um, it creates an opportunity for developers, whether individually or co in a corporate context, to exert power over others. And then he finds that yeah. utterly objectionable, and so yes, it was like okay, let's construct licenses that have the the reverse effect. Yeah. So yeah, I, this is part of my own you know, connection to this. So interesting observation. Absolutely. Johan, did you mention your special is something that people don't know about you? There are so many things people don't know about me. <laughs> let's, let's um, talk about one thing. <laughs> special thing, you know. I um, let me think about that, and we'll give give Roland his uh, his okay. opportunity to intro, and maybe everyone will forget. So uh, I was a teenager during the eighties, so it was sort of Apple IIs and CPM machines, and occasional uh, IBM PC running DOS. And uh, when I arrived at university, the university had a an Armdale mainframe. Running Unix. It took me about 15 minutes to just like, <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> this is this is the real thing. Uh, and so, uh, pretty quickly, of course, I mean, it's a much more powerful environment than what I've been accustomed to. The BBSs were fun, and that's great, but the the, the stuff that that Unix allows is quite extraordinary compared to the much simpler operating systems that I was accustomed to. Pretty quickly, of course, because this was at the time like the university had one central mainframe. And then the School of Computing Science happened to have a sort of a great big sun machine with a bunch of X terminals. But of course, in both cases, admin access was clearly unavailable, and that meant a whole bunch of things that Unix allowed you to do were unavailable to us. And so, uh, with some help from a staff member and a lot of enthusiastic involvement, we set up a programmer's society, which, to my continuing astonishment, is not only still operating, it celebrated its 30th birthday yesterday. It was a party in Sydney with 70 people. 
really <laughs> three decades ago that happened. Um, and so, yeah, we had by various ways got our hands on uh, mini computers, mostly sun equipment. And then by about 92, both um, Torvald's early Linux was out and Jollets had released 3xx BSD. And so quite suddenly, in about the same year, like on two different paths, it was possible to run a full Linux, a full Unix-ish system on a PC. And it, that was mind-blowing. <laughs> and so, um, yes, the ability to, to, to study the code, to improve the code on my machine, to share all that stuff, that was uh, really important as a rationale for open source being important. Uh, but over time, the other thing that I began to become aware of was you know, Stallman constantly um, uh, sort of expressing his philosophy in a variety of different ways, began to notice that some of what he was saying resonated, that the, the s sort of potentially severe power imbalance between individuals and large organizations and or commercial or government uh, concerns me a lot. And so the, um, my perspective is not exactly the same as Stallman's, but certainly very heavily lean towards the F in Pulse Asia, more than the O. Um, and for that reason, I work as a chief privacy officer. And my role is sorting out personal data protection uh, issues, compliance, risk management, and ethics uh, in the context of an analytics company that analyzes data about people in an employment context. And so I'm also, and I'll talk later today about GDPR and how GDPR and software freedom are fairly closely aligned, remarkably closely aligned, in fact. And that, so that's, the pieces sort of fit together, but. Yeah, like most of us, the path where it was going wasn't obvious until it happened. <laughs> what brought me to FOSS Asia? So, uh, Hong Fook and I guess Mario were running FOSS Asia in neighboring countries, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos maybe, yes. Um, and in late 2014, Hong Fook came to Singapore um, to explore the idea of running FOSS Asia in Singapore. You'd studied here, right? So, so she was familiar with the city, but um, wanted to try running the conference here. And so she turned up at a weekly um, networking open house, I think is a better way of saying it, at uh, JFDI, which was a technology startup accelerator program that was running at the time, um, looking for people who were interested to support. And we met, and it's like, yes, that's awesome. <laughs> we definitely need to do that. Um, and of course, this is for me an extension of having been part of the group that set up Hackerspace here. It's, it's the, that same interest in being able to play uh, with technology, to sort of find people who, are, who enjoy doing that sort of thing, and to sort of encourage the, the normalization of that. Uh, events have overtaken us. In 10 years of Hackerspace's operation, uh, the world has changed and Singapore has changed faster, as usual. And so it's less important to be sort of proselytizing that sort of uh, approach. But the so the whole maker support and everything else that's going on here is, is sort of independent of, of hackerspace. But there was nothing going on that was um, specifically pushing or encouraging development and understanding in both prompts, both the free and open source elements. And so, yeah, I was like, okay, <laughs> this has fallen in my lap. How can I help? And yeah, the, the first bits of it were, it, introducing Hong Fook to uh, people who could provide venues. So the first year we ran, we rented a, a theater for the Friday track, but we then had a bunch of people out of Block 71 just open their premises to us to provide the, the breakout rooms. So I found, I think all but one of those, um, invited a minister to come and speak. That was absolutely amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Roland has also been a big supporter to other very important members in, in the team. So I know that whenever I have any problem, the first person that we think of is Roland. And you know that at one point we, we talk and I, you say something that I will never forget. So I asked Roland, why are you always like willing to help other people? Where do you get time for yourself? But even though he ran a lot of projects himself, and he told me that by helping other people, I, I, I can actually learn something new, learn the new way to solve the problem in the more effective way. So it's not for me, it's not a loss, so, but it, it's a gain by helping other people. And I never forget that. So thank you very much to continue your support to, to Force Asia and the organization of the summit. You're welcome. 
Um, moving on, it's always very fascinating to hear story of everyone here. So I'm still very curious. I try to talk to as many speakers as possible here at Force Asia, but 200 people is really not possible. So Michael and I, yesterday, we thought about let's sit down and, and write together a book about people in open source. So we hope that <laughs> that will kick up in the next year or so. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's move on. Let us now talk about sustaining false projects. Yeah. So Duran, the day before or yesterday, you have a talk about sustainable um, project through sponsorship, I believe. Could you, um, and I read something, uh, one article where you wrote the, different, the difference between corporate donors and corporate sponsor. Yeah. So, in the position of giving out funding for the for projects, could you please it, explain a little bit about this and uh, how? What are your ideas or suggest open source project to to sustain open source project? So, for context for people who weren't um, in the room for the talk that I gave a couple of days ago, um, the sustaining fast projects talk uh, centered around a thing that we're trying this year, where uh, the sponsorship dollars that we give to projects that we support are determined by people at Indeed who make open source contributions. So you make an open source contribution, you vote on where the donation goes. Right? Um, there's a lot more information about that. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. Um, but it's, it's really only like a tiny piece of the problem, right? Um, if you look across uh, all the conversations and all the uh, the, com uh, the problems that have come up uh, since Heartbleed and um, you know, other projects in the intervening time that have expressed uh, problems with maintainer burnout and, and um, you know, just a very small number of people who are doing a tremendous amount of work trying to keep core free and open source projects running, um, giving them money doesn't make more time. It doesn't reduce their burnout. Right? Um, and so the, the long-term goal uh, of the program that we're trying to build is is design, we're trying to design the program that gets people inside the company more involved in the projects that we use, right? Uh, and contributing into those and helping pick up maintenance burden uh, and so on. There's a fascinating metaphor, at least it's fascinating to me as I, as I kind of look across the stage. There's, there's two people from a corporate perspective, there's our, our panel moderator and there's two people from the community and the corporate guys have two of the mics, right? So the community guys are sharing a mic between the two of them, right? <laughs> Uh, and, and, it's a, and it's a fascinating metaphor if you look at it. <laughs> and this is what we have to do, right? Are you right? sponsoring a microphone now? <laughs> no, no, we, we, we have to be more involved as corporate citizens in making sure that we're getting the community the resources it needs. And sometimes the, that means making sure that they have funding to run events, and sometimes that means they have funding to pay for infrastructure or to buy hardware if they need it. But more importantly, and much more importantly, it means that uh, we are allowing our employees to help lift the maintenance burden for projects kind of across the board. Right. That's my, we had, Mario had asked me my sort of view on this or part of it uh, a week or two back and sort of off the top of my head, variants of that. The, what I suspect is occurring, I think it's occurring, will keep occurring, is that the interests of businesses generally and larger organizations in particular will increasingly uh, affect what's happening in open source. Um, part of it is the engineers are simply sitting in sort of um, corporate environments uh, whose interests in having an efficient way to produce software are well suited by having p people in their teams contribute to the sort of low-level non-differentiating stuff uh, rather than the whole multi metered here problem and go and build a low grade one internally that's more costly, worse, less reliable, less capable, et cetera. Um, the other, it's actually three or four, but um, the other big one is that software is eating the world and it, it, that, that dynamic will continue to shape uh, various things for, I would imagine, a couple of decades at least. That means that the demand for engineers within organizations is going up, and particularly the demand for engineers' time. And so this thing, the point about money doesn't provide a solution to burnout. What does is corporations being able to reshape job roles to allow those support functions, uh, those maintenance, particularly the drudge work 
that people would rather sort of just get done on a payroll than have to get that spend their weekends doing. So partly it's yeah, let's encourage organizations to do it, but partly I suspect that the recruiting interests of corporations will encourage exactly that behavior. And this, I saw this as far back as the mid 2000s with uh, Google hiring Andrew Morton. And when I asked him at the next conference Australia that year, so what are you doing at Google? He says, well, pretty much the same thing I was doing before. You know, just cool. Andrew Morton's a Google, uh, sorry, Linux kernel maintainer. Um, and so, yeah, you know, f fixing code, connecting people, occasionally doing a talk for Google, but mostly just doing the stuff he was doing. And so that, you know, what Google was doing a decade ago, I suspect that many more companies are now having to do um, much lower down the sort of pecking order, if you like, simply because they need to in order to recruit. And I'm going to hand the mic to you and, and stop talking. The, the thing that I, that I want to drive us toward as an entire industry is less thinking about hiring that, that one like really well-known open source engineer and more about getting all of the engineers doing a little bit of work on all the things that they touch kind of all the time. Right? Um, I, I think the, the net lift we can get that for, it will be much more significant and, and much more beneficial to solve the problem. But um, it's, it's, it's going to be slow to get there. It's going to take time but, to get there. But that's the idea of sort of working down the, the, the the pecking order, if you like, that the what was 10 years ago, a sort of get a high-profile guy to demonstrate that Google was serious, it is now turning into help. <laughs> How do I get engineers to work for me? <laughs> so that I think is happening, starting to happen by itself. It'll develop over time. So Dorian, this wasn't the script we agreed on when we were sitting in our back rooms with our cigars. <laughs> 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 um, so, so I totally agree with with Dorian that. Um, for larger companies, engagement really means bringing anything and everything that a project needs, right? And I think that's what Dwayne was saying, right? Which is not always money, but deep organizational change, right? And I think one of the things that my organization has been struggling with is how to equate like GitHub stars to money that we pay our engineers, right? Because that's, that's really putting your money where your mouth is, right? You can't. You, you're not actually incentivizing people to move up in an organization if you're not awarding them monetarily for for contributions, right? But figuring out a good way to do that, figuring out a way to do that that's meaningful is much is very very challenging and and not easy to game. Yeah, it's very easy to game, and 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 so that's that's something that we we, we would like to work on, right? To to have full time people work on open source and things like that, um, but I think. When I think about the sustainability problem, I'm actually very optimistic because I feel like I feel like there's a lot of possible solutions out there, but I feel like I also feel like that you know, and this is sort of what my talk was about. But I feel like as open source moves more into the mainstream, I think people that the overwhelming majority of companies don't do open source, and people in the community, engineers, as we as we as we sort of train engineers to talk talk more sort of to sell better sell open source right I think I think I think there will be more adoption at a wider variety of companies and I think that's only a, I think that's the biggest one of the biggest parts sort of reservoirs of untapped potential to spread adoption right is to spread adoption of it you know in a way that 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 sort of infects more of sort of corporate corporate interests where we inter inter intertwine them with corporate interests but at the same time, the key is, of course, maintaining our values while we're doing that. So, Larry, so I want to ask a little bit about the Fordham Conference. So it's been around almost 20 years. Yeah, how do you sustain the conference? And is there any challenges that we could share with our partner here that we could they could support you in the future? So. Um how does Fossum sustain itself? Um, we we have um, two, well, two major sources of, of income. Uh, one is of course sponsorship. Um, so if Facebook would want to sponsor, you'd be very welcome to. Um, just putting that there. Um, the, and the other one is the one that we really really value the most because um, it is um, by our community. We ask for donations. 
um, voluntary donations and you get a t-shirt in return for your kind donation, of mm -hmm. course. Um, but about half of the, of the income of, of Fosdom is made by the community. The conference is completely free to attend. It's completely open. There is no registration. You just show up, walk into a room, attend the talk, be there, um, engage with uh, people holding a stand. Um, we don't care who you are or where you come from. Um, just be there and enjoy yourself. Um, and getting donations from the community is really important for us in, uh, as it really shows how much people value what we're doing and what we're providing. Um, and we try to, well, run a very tight show. So um, we try to spend, well, every euro that we spend, we look at it twice before we actually do it. Uh, we're entirely volunteer based, so no one gets paid to uh, to, to organize for them, uh, which obviously reduces cost. Um, so that is uh, that, that that is how we how we work. Um, the most challenging part of it all is actually um, trying to convince sponsors of the value of Fosdem, because one of the things that we do, what we do tell our sponsors, is that we're sorry, we're grateful for your contribution, but we cannot offer you any anything in terms of content. Um, there is no sponsored talks at Fosdem. A sponsor can have a talk, but that is completely unrelated to, to them being a sponsor. The program committee and the sponsorship team are, th there's an air gap between them, and that's, it's there for a reason. Sponsor people do not talk to the program team as do not influence anything. Uh, same goes for stands. Um, we, we offer sponsors the most visibility we can without intruding into the content. Uh, so we'll go as far as uh, you know, showing your logo, saying thank you in the opening talk and in the closing talk, but that's pretty much it. And we see that the sponsors that we get actually get that message and truly want to want, want to support the community. And they don't really care about um, being present with five or six recruiters and you know talking to people to, to find jobs. No, they want their engineers to attend and their engineers to enjoy a conference with great content and are participate in that way. Julian, how about our situation here at Force Asia? So we've been, uh, this is a permanent discussion, uh, with a variety of trade-offs. Um, one of our bugbears has been catering. Uh, if we don't have, if we have either no registration or free registration, we can't cater correctly. We just don't know how many people will turn up. Um, and I, I actually, how do you do that? So just go to the cafe yourself, or what's the... No, so um, we don't provide catering on site. Um, so I mean, I'm amazed by by the abundance of food everywhere. Almost every room I walk, I walk into has some kind of drinks or food or whatever. It, it's pretty cool to see. But no, we don't provide food to our attendees. So we have a we invite food vendors, street vendors, right. um, and people can just you know, buy right. stuff from there. Okay, so that that might also be tied up with sort of expectations here. It's, it's the norm that everything is catered. It's our schedule also very tight, so we try to make it as convenient as possible to, to the attendees, which also depends on the financial situation of, of each year. So when we get more support, then we try to offer the maximum convenience for the people. And also I want Roland to explain a little bit be, be, the gap between business and community. So we, running for Asia, we want to have the image of we want to welcome not only the com developer, of course, or we welcome, but also enterprise. So that's the idea to bring people from different fields together. So, um, that's, so that's a conscious choice. Mm -hmm. That the uh, it's just the, the engagement with Daimler right, was the, mm -hmm. uh, the most extraordinary form we've had so far, um, and it perhaps it's part of your sort of pursuing corporate adoption. But it is we're dealing with. With sponsors not merely as sources of cash, although I think we, that's pretty damn important, um, but also as a variant of my other comments, that the the progression, certainly the next decade or two, for open source, quite apart from free software, is going to mean deeper engagement with with large corporations because that's where the money is, that's where the jobs are, that's where the engineers are going to end up being for most of their careers, and so there's everything from the very light interaction we're having with, with Facebook this year to the 
um, multiple sessions, a consultation, and a, a separate dinner uh, that occurred with Diamond Chrysler well, for two years, actually, uh, ahead of them forming an internal open source division, uh, which for an old world manufacturing company is a bit of a uh, change in culture. Um, so, yes, within, within FOSS Asia, there's a conscious drive to engage with corporates as partners and almost targets, if that's, if that's the right word, but as, because it is, it is partners, it's not anything that's happening involuntarily, but it's to directly assist in that, in that process. The, I think the state that we need to or want to get to is to to stop thinking about uh, the the corporation and the community, and start thinking about the community. The, you know, like the, the corporations don't join a community; people in a corporation join a community, right? Um, uh, corporations don't sponsor events; people write checks to sponsor events, and, and so on. Um, and, and as long as we continue to to frame the thinking around, you know, there's the people from the corporate world, and then there's the community. It, it maintains that division. Um, where we can think about, like, we are members of a community. Now, there are good reasons that the community sometimes looks at, you know, corporate decisions or corporate participants with skepticism. Companies do not always act in the best interest of the community. They often act in their own best interests. And uh, I, I think it's the responsibility of people who run open source program offices and who share knowledge with each other to make sure that their companies are showing up as good members of the community. And most of the people that I uh, know that are involved in those efforts have that very much on, on their mind. Um, it hasn't always been the case. Uh, you, know, uh, y you talked about how uh, sponsors for, for FOSDEM, they, they don't get special you know, uh, treatment as far as getting you know, talks placed and everything else. We've, we've had that here this year. One of, the, I won't say who, but one of the sponsors was pressing for what was very clearly a product pitch for a closed source product. I'm like, uh, that's, no. Right. <laughs> that's, I don't think that's good behavior on, on, the, beh on the behalf of the company, right? Um, but not everyone in the company, in any given company, kind of gets it. And there's, if you look at like, uh, so the closest thing uh, probably a typical corporate events team has to, to, to think about when looking at the community events in FOSDEM and, and FOS Asia and free open source events is trade shows. And it's more normal at something like a trade show that you write a big check and you get some time. Right. Of course, we always end up talking to marketing because it looks like a trade show. Exactly, and it, it takes a lot of education to, to, to get people there. So, um, you know, uh, for people who run programs or are involved in open source programs, continuing to do advocacy for the community, that is a key part of the role. And if it's something that you're leaving out of your role, then, then it's something that we should be thinking about. Thank you. So I think that we only have a few minutes left. I would like to um, open the floor to the audience. If you have any question for our panelists about um, open source, how to sustain open source yeah, projects, uh, conference. Especially co questions for Michael, who doesn't want to take the microphone from me. <laughs> no? OK, so um, then I would like to um, get back to the panelists for the final questions. So what would be the one action every person here in the audience can take away when they leave Post Asia today? I'll jump right in and give everybody else uh, a time to, time to think about it. Um, there is something that you can do today to make a difference for a conference, for an open source project, for uh, a community event, for a community space um, that you've been, you might not even have even recognized it, but y you may have recognized it and felt like it was outside your reach. And maybe that's going back to your company and, and just asking someone for the first time, hey, I think we should sponsor this. Or maybe it's finding that project that you use all the time that you've, you've never opened an issue on or never gone and tried to participate in the thing. There is something everyone in the room is capable of doing um, that they may have been hesitant today. Um, there's the only thing that is stopping you from doing that is, is sort of your own hesitation. I encourage you to find those. If you can't find them, come find us and we'll help you find opportunities to get involved. I'd, oh, sorry. 
Um, I would like to, you know, tag on to that. Um, many of you have probably written some software. I have been guilty of that too. Um, and thought that it was not really relevant for other people. It may not be, you know, very special or it may be very specific to do a task. Um, but just, you know, consider releasing it as open source. I mean, it, it may be sitting in your back on your backup drive somewhere doing nothing, but it may be of interest to someone. So don't be shy and just, you know, publish it. Don't wait until you think it's perfect. It is much, much more important to release it as soon as possible so other people can, you know, maybe help you find your way and improve your project as you go. A sort of variant of those and came up with a friend in Sydney who's a bit sort of bummed that he's realized that what he's trying to do was too complicated and therefore he can't get it done. Uh, sometimes the hesitance uh, arises just because you've set your scope too big. And, and then this is with starting anything at all, okay, fine, you, you know, if we can't jump across a canyon in one step, uh, what? Start with a, a smaller subset. Eat, eat one piece of the elephant at a time. So if it's if you're in that situation, just pick something a little bit smaller and get it done. Whether it's a conversation with a colleague or a request for, a, for an employer or a bug fix or a bug report or a documentation collection or a whatever it is, you know, pick a small thing and do it, and then you know, repeat. I, I don't have anything really unique to say beyond that, but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I, I think I, I like what was said about not differentiating between the community and the, the corporate in the same way. We, we spend so much of our lives at work, right? And so I think the, the, one, the one thing on top of everything, you know, I, I, think, I think the action is to do something, but I think, I think beyond that, I think it, one thing that I would think would be really helpful is, is to take the energy and the community that we have here, right, and in a sort of kind of a creepy way, start spreading it at, at work, right? Where, where, you know, look at the people at work as people yet to be converted, right? Um, and, uh, and start there, right? Because there's a lot of people there who, who, who could be interested, right? And we spend so much time there. And that, that's what I think, um, and it starts with one of the actions that we talked about here, right? Okay, so that is all the time that we have. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, audience, for joining this session. And enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>